Come on. There we go. Almost up. It says we're live, but I'm not showing the feed. Anybody want to give me feedback? You Oh, there we go. I've got live. Yeah, I got it. We're up. All right. So, everybody, welcome to uh, our roundtable discussion about time trial fit. Today we have um, Brian Stover. Say hi, Brian. Hello, everybody. We have Dan Enfield. Eric Reed. Hello. And we have Kylie Austin Young. And as always, well, second time, I'm your host. Uh, what we're going to get into today is um, a brief synopsis of, uh, you know, where time trial fits are. And I guess, you know, should differentiate that real quick. I got taken a task uh, on slow twitch uh, about thing, fit positions being different. And we'll, we'll chat about that a little bit. Um, but triathlon, which everybody here outside of myself is, uh, is into, um, and then time trial fits, um, or we'll talk about the orthodoxy of where things are now, um, where they're going, um, where they've been and how those two might actually, um, have overlapped, uh, the benefits of, uh, um, aerodynamic gains and what Eric's doing that's maybe a little bit different when it comes to fits and why he's driving them. But uh, any questions that you guys have while we're going on this discussion? Um, van life kind of, oh, it's James already thrown in comments, sorry. So uh, any questions, go ahead and post them up. Uh, in the chat, I'll be monitoring that, and we'll we'll sneak those in as we can get them in. And uh, yeah, so hopefully we'll have a great discussion. And I want to thank all of you um, for agreeing to do this, and all of you that are watching. So, real quick, I'm going to open up the floor to uh, to Dan to give us um, just a quick synopsis. You don't have to go very in depth, but orthodoxy. You know where. Where triathlon and bike fit is right now. Uh, and as Kylie would like to know, explain okay. what orthodoxy is. Okay, um, I'll get going. And uh, I hear someone's dog in the background, which means my dogs are going to start barking too when they hear those dogs. So uh, if you don't mind, I don't mind. Um, I'm blaming the UPS driver. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he's due at my house too pretty soon, so you'll hear mine chiming in as well. Um, and so I'll give you my couple minutes on. Hey. I'll give you my couple minutes on orthodoxy, and I talk about this a lot, and and I use that word a lot, and and I use it on purpose, and and the reason is um, I uh, uh, I have a view. Um, and I've held this view for a long time that really in all of sport, um, we ought to um, honor the people um, who represent, uh, who historically and currently represent the best among us at, at excellence. And so if you are a golfer or a, or a baseball player or a triathlete, um, if there's, uh, uh, if you and your fellows, uh, if, if, if 80% of you, let's say, do certain things a particular way, then that, uh, that constitutes a consensus, and consensus uh, sort of defines orthodoxy. And so in 1980, what, seven, the arrow bars came along. It took us, I don't know, maybe two years to figure out how to use those things. And so I came out with my tri-bike designs in 1989, and, and I didn't create a position all I did was put a bike up underneath a position we were already riding. Um, and so I think that speaks to um, why this consensus uh, um, formed and how quickly it formed um, and, and, and why it's, it's been so durable, why the elements of tri-bike fit have been so durable over the last, well, really, what, 30, 30 years, I guess? 
Um, and so uh, what are those elements? Uh, obviously a steeper seat angle. And so when I first came out with my tri bikes, they, the seat angle was 80 degrees. And uh, there's a, a number of elements to them that people thought were pretty crazy at the time. Uh, bearing in mind that we all use setback seat posts then. And so if you really drew a line up uh, from the bottom bracket up through the center of the saddle's rails, it was probably in the 78, 79 degree seat angle range and I, I think most people would agree that that's pretty much where we still are with the proviso that you don't really make bikes that way any longer because uh, with the advent of split nose saddles uh, the, the seats actually rotating back slightly uh, because of the just the mechanics of how you sit on those saddles but the hips uh, pretty much are in the same place today as they were in 1989 1990 um, and so uh, that's sort of the first element of orthodoxy. Beyond that, uh, it's, it's just a pretty square position. The, um, the torso makes uh, a rel relatively perpendicular line uh, to sort of a line you know, running down from the hips to the bottom bracket. And then uh, the upper arm and the torso form roughly a right angle and the upper arm and the forearm form roughly a right angle. So it's just a series of right angles. Uh, why is that the case? Well, it's, I don't think it's that important. It's secondary to me to answer the question of why. It's, it's primarily important to answer the question just that. That, this is the way riders ride. You can discuss why riders ride this way, and we can all have our different ideas about that, but what's important is that riders ride this way. In my opinion, my best guess as, as to the reason, and really what we're largely talking about here is what happens from the shoulders forward. I, th I think when we, get into, when, when we get into our arm wrestle, I think it's shoulders forward that most of us uh, are gonna find disagreements among, amongst ourselves, or, or at least uh, the opinions will diverge, the, the possibilities will diverge, the options will diverge. Um, I think the reason for that right angle between the torso and the upper arm is that the upper arm, having the upper arm at a, at a right angle to the weight it's supporting um, is, is just that place where you can rest most easily. Um, now, I didn't say anything about aerodynamics. And my view has always been the tri-bike fit. Uh, bearing in mind that when I started bike racing, we were nailing our cleats onto our shoes. And so, you know, I go back a ways. And so, you know, with every advent, you know, when we went to five gears to six, I mean, that was, like, whoa, <laughs> wow, we've, we've arrived now. Uh, so uh, as we move forward, uh, you know, I did the Hawaiian Ironman in 1981 on a standard road race bike. You know, all those pictures you see with skid lids and, you know, that's when I did it. Um, so... When we got to aero bars and then we figured out how to use the aero bars and then we started to make bikes that uh, that accommodated the use of aero bars the ability to rest the top half of uh, the top half of my body skeletally on the front of my bike i mean that was that was heaven and so i i've always been fain to give that up and i think a lot of other athletes have have discovered the same thing that over the long haul um, you really don't want to give up the ability to rest your upper body on the front of the bike, almost like a front recumbent. Uh, and so that's, that's orthodoxy. Um, so uh, with that, let's talk about where we go from here. Yeah, okay. So that was actually a lot uh, more concise than I thought it might be. So thanks for that, Dan. Um, you brought up a couple of points, I guess, you know, that uh, we'll get into here with, with Eric in a second. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the front end comfort, um, the hip angle, um, that's kind of something I think Kylie's got a big, uh, oh, what's a good term? Well, anyways, a, a large interest in, you know, you know, being on the right saddle. That if maybe? Uh, what's that? Better. 
Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so we'll, we'll hit on those points. I just wanted to highlight that um, and how maybe that's a, you know, kind of not one of the changes, but something that we see is guys riding really, really open um, and forcing them into something that moves you outside of what the consensus is, right? Like I know we got one one guy that likes to post up a lot on slow twitch. He's, uh, it, you know, you'd think he was some kind of uh, six foot nine uh, athlete because his reach is so damn long. But anyways, so uh, Eric, if um, I'm gonna unmute you here, I got you muted. Uh, so Eric, if you could maybe take it from there, what, uh, what, what Dan was saying, kind of explain how your fits might differ from those uh, right angles that, uh, that Dan was talking about and, and how you came to kind of um, move in that direction as far as your fit philosophy goes. Well, I feel like I'm being uh, painted into a corner here, but I guess I'll have to uh, represent this side of the argument. And I think we can call it heterodoxy. Um, but first of all, you know, about me, I, you know, I kind of read the fist system and I'd like to share my screen if I could. Yeah. Um, this is me in 2000 and nope, wrong one. This is me in 2006 before I found slow twitch. Can you see that? Uh, well, you got to hit the screen share button over on the left. Go okay, ahead. You. you got it? Okay, I see on the left. Okay, got it. Yep. Dead air. It's never a good thing. <laughs> okay, I just me. want to say that when, when Eric said what he said, this was me in 2006 before I found Slow Twitch. I, I kind of expected what, and I was lost and aimless and I didn't know where I was going and I had a, I had a hole in my heart and slow twitch. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> it would have went there, but I had technical difficulties. Okay. This is me. This is, me. This is after a, a, you know, a professional bike fit. Uh, and it, it was entirely driven by me and my discomfort with my saddle, which Kylie can appreciate. Uh, but there's a lot of other things going on here that, are obviously, you know, less than optimal. And then I just read, I read the, the fifth system the next year and did this just by following the quadratic formulas and the, if you follow the flow of the fifth system, one through nine or so, this is what I just followed it and it came up with this. Now, this is 2007 and I say this is a pretty decent position and fairly orthodox. Um, Hey Eric, let me let me interrupt you there. The, the, your photos aren't showing. Okay. You wanna you wanna fire them over to me? You can shoot them in an email. You can keep talking, and I'll uh, uh, I'll throw them up. Um, or you could continue. Okay, I'm, not, I'm not getting. Okay. Yeah, this is not a good discussion if you can't see it. <laughs> um, the point is, is that you know, I was just you know, this was 2007 just a person on the internet. And I found this resource, which really, it, you know, set the foundation for my own personal bike fit. Um, and then it was very easy for me to, to apply that knowledge because like one of the things that Dan says in, in the system, anyone can do it. Who's reasonably, you know, fit and trim, I think he says. And so it went, it went really well. If, you, if, if you're following along on slow twitch, you can look at my user profile um, and you can click, click on my profile and you can see the before and after. Can you see it now? What are you guys seeing? Oh, we got it, we got it. Okay. All right, so this is me. This is me after a professional bike fit. And then this is the same, pretty much the same person six months later after reading Slow Twitch. Uh, the thing about the second picture is, is that I went well away from this due to peer pressure and people, you know, due to social, you know, social 
kind of cues where people kind of moved me away from it. Uh, you know, that it was too, it was too something, but I, I just followed the, I just followed the, um, just followed the so, protocol. And that's what, that's what, that's how it's Eric, so Eric, what you're saying is Pete, you people saw this, this current position yes. and they dissuaded you from it because your former position was more what they thought you should, how you, they thought you should be right. Yeah, all of my friends, even the Kona qualifiers, all rode like this. Oh, and they, you know, you're stronger this way. You can you can really hold the arrow bar. You know, this was 2006, seven, uh, and this was me following following the protocol. And wow. things things just kind of you know, eventually I I came back to this just a couple of years ago, um, actually thanks to James Haycraft who sold me a bike part for my Cervelo that got me into the position um, I'm in now. So that was, that's, that's been 12 years now. Um, so this, this information is not, I don't, I don't really know what it is that I'm doing any differently um, because I feel like my position in 2007 is, was pretty orthodox. I would agree. Well, now that's interesting. So we don't have a discussion to have. No, actually, <laughs> I'm just trying to set the stage here. Yeah, um, I, I, I guess I think the discussion is which is be which is better, right? I think we're trying to figure out at least I think those of us who are interested in performance bets, what's you know the most uh, conducive to performance? What's the fastest fit overall across? you know, all use cases. And, you know, I guess that's, that's the question. I guess we can start by asking you, <laughs> which, you know, why you've decided to land where you are now. And what, what are the reasons why you sort of, uh, besides social reasons, uh, you know, fluctuated between orthodoxy and not. Yeah, I, I like this bit. So talk about the, well, maybe you were gonna talk about this. Well, I don't feel like, I, you know, I, I feel a little self-conscious being the one to defend what so many other people are doing. And quite frankly, who, 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 who have influenced me, I don't think that I'm an influencer. I think other people have, are the ones that are driving this, but I see, I see two key things that are happening uh, that affects what's ha what's going on with bike fits. And the first is, is the snub nose saddle. That's, that's a huge game changer. And then I think the second is there are a lot of niche companies making components that are designed to hold us the way we want them to hold us rather than us to conform to the way that they're made uh, mostly coming out of the uk and so that's changing also you have you know 51 speed shop tri-rig so there's two things there's the saddle and then there's the the populist movement of making bike parts that are you you know it, for each individual how they want to be held rather than a mass market product i think those those two things are really driving the changes well can, I, I, guess, can I ask a, can i ask a question of you guys if you don't mind pardon my interruption but i i'm, I'm asking it of all of you guys because you guys are more uh sort of at the leading edge of um of this position that we're seeing up on the screen right now um and and there's there's two questions that i have or maybe three one is to me this position is entirely orthodox with one exception and that is uh that if you took the if you took the rider's arms and you simply rotated them forward without changing anything else about the body if you froze my orthodox position in amber and then you separated the arms from the rest of the body right at the shoulder and you and you put stuck a pin in it like a butterfly collection and you just rotated the arms or, you forward pivoting them forward around about the axis of the shoulder that's what this new position is and so my first question is is that true my second question is is that legal for time trial riders that is to say, 
uh, how is it nowadays? Is it does the race have to be on the national calendar in order to to be subject to uh, to uh, UCI rules? And and at some point you're going to get to some sort of world championship qualifier or or something like that uh, or national championship qualifier, and then I think you're again subject to the rules. So I'd like to know about the rules, and then C is uh, uh, is this is this a position that is comfortably written in training and racing for the duration of the event, you know, 40K or whatever. So, Dan, real quick, before anybody answers up on that one, um, you are referring to Lucy Brash uh, that we have up here on the screen right now? I am, I'm referring to this Herbal Life Rider on this okay. page. Yep, okay. Yeah, just making, making, making sure. Um, as far as the rules go, I'll just I'll tell you <laughs> real quick. I don't have them verbatim in front of me, um, but their application is far and few between. Um, you'll get them at Worlds. You'll get them at any UCI event. Uh, so if you're an amateur and you're racing uh, in the United States, uh, you really you don't run into uh, any issues. Um, like at Masters Nationals, you won't have problems. Obviously, at elite nationals, uh, that's a different story. Um, but you know, you got to be kind of a big dog to be there. So well, the last time I did it, the last time I did this was I don't know four or five years ago, and it was state TT, and I rolled up to the line, and they rolled my bike right up to a jig. Yeah, and they, and they said it's coming, and you know, I was riding in that in fifty five, fifty nine, or something. And you know, so you can ride this today, sir, but don't get used to it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it never came. It never came. They uh, uh, they really never applied that to uh, – I mean, I when I raced at Nationals, my bike didn't go in a jig. So – and it um, it wasn't like it is now. Um, and, there are, and there was a couple rules that weren't kind of how they are now. But – you can have a pretty extreme bike uh, or what looks extreme. Like my bike outside of the shifters, you know, if I were to switch shifters, like uh, to the, the new one buttons, it would be, um, I would have no, no issue passing a jig. So, you know, I don't, I don't run my, I don't take the saddle setback exemption. So I get the, the, the extra five, um, uh, uh, centimeters up front and I can run. Can I stop you there and ask you, because this is another question I have. Yeah, go. Do you get to take whatever ME you want or do they, yes. they yeah. say, well, you're shorter than 510, so you get to take, what is it, 1.3.013, I think it is, the saddle nose, um, or do they choose your ME for you? Does Ed, does Ed, Does everyone get one of them? And can you choose the one you want, or do they choose the one you're getting? So everybody gets one. Um, they don't choose any – you get to choose what you're going to get. So you can either slam your saddle forward and run 75, and I think if you're over a certain height, I forget what it is, you get an extra five centimeters uh, of reach. Uh, or you can run your saddle setback at minus five or minus ten, as long as it's, you know, five back. And then you can get the uh, the extension exemption. So it's um, yeah, you, you you pretty much pick it. And then there's also the 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 rocks. You can only have a 10 centimeter rise from the center of your pad to uh, the top of your shifters. So that's the other one that comes into play. Um, so this so this lady Lucy, she'll probably fall afoul of that, right? So this is certainly not UCI legal. Um, and that is definitely one of the things that I think about in my fit philosophy is that I'm not worried about those regulations unless I'm fitting an actual time trialist. And I feel like there are benefits of, you know, I, ha I have an opinion that longer is better for two reasons. One, it opens up some doors aerodynamically and I also have a view that it opens up some doors for comfort. Um, so certainly, I'm, I don't think that you should constrain yourself to UCI rules if you don't have to. Uh, also, 
you know, a lot of time trials, you know, like Jim Manton said, they pedal the bike a lot differently and don't have to run after. So this, this position is quite different from a time, like a time trialist position and certainly wouldn't, it would be too long. Uh, the hands are too high. Um, but this is actually, she self-selected that stuff. Um, and she's, she's been comfortable for, she's going to do her first Ironman here in a, in a couple months. Uh, but for half Ironmans, you know, for two hours and 25 minutes, she's certainly been very comfortable with this. But I think, uh, you know, from my philosophy perspective, I think about that. I think about what is available when you don't have to take into account the UCI rules and what does it mean and what can we do with it? And I think um, we're seeing it um, a lot on slow twitch now with people going to the tunnel and, and testing things out at the velodrome um, and trying out things that are outside of the UCI regs. Okay, but Eric, you just brought something up that I think is worth <clears throat> discussing, which is why is this a time trial discussion? Why is this also a triathlon discussion? Because if, if Lucy's getting ready to do an Ironman, then it's a triathlon discussion too. And and I'm look, or, orthodoxy is reflective. It's it's not um, it's not prescriptive. Orthodoxy, uh, from my point of view, simply looks at what people are doing, and it and 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 then it and then it tries to find patterns and then it, it, it takes patterns if and only if they're found and packages them um, into a set of best practices <clears throat> so you know i've never golfed in my life other than mini golf but i assume there's best practices associated with how you swing the darn clubs right so i mean there's pros and they'll tell you swing it this way and my guess is that they didn't just think it up. They they watched good golfers and they noticed what those good golfers did. And so orthodoxy is fluid. It's going to change. Orthodoxy exists today. But I promise you, I don't know what's going to change, but I promise you, triathlon bike fit's not going to look like this in 50 years. And so, you know, it could be that you guys are onto something uh, that, that will describe what orthodoxy is five years, ten years from now. And that's why I'd like to use the word heterodoxy rather than unorthodox. I think unorthodox is completely out of the box, but heterodoxy is just a slight change from what's going on, uh, just slightly different. Um, and we're looking at Rohan Dennis here, I think. Uh, but I think that what I try to do is to help people get what, what Rohan has here that I think are the keys to his fit, which are his shoulders, if you look from the front, are not visible. They're in line with his lats. Uh, and his head is in line with his body. And that's, for me, that was 40 watts in the wind tunnel uh, between two tests when I went from my old position to my new position. It turned out to be 40 watts. And I used to think that, that only time trials could do that because they are good at suffering and scrunching and um, but what I found is with, with a lot of people is that just by adding reach, it makes the shoulders disappear and the head tucks in. And so why not take advantage of the fact that we don't use UCI rules and just add, add the reach, which is, which as we've said is unsustainable, um, unless you tilt. And so I think that's where things are going. That's the when you say tilt, you're talking about the saddle, right? Yes. Or you're talking about the saddle on the one hand and the bars on the other. So I have I have a view that there is a horizontal component of of the body weight, uh, and that the new saddles that we're dealing with now have contributed to a forward component of body weight because they're meant to be ride slightly tilted down, and then so the opposite reaction to that it would be to tilt your pads up to create and to have a horizontal component of weight the other direction to cancel out the sliding forward feeling. And then you just kind of lock yourself in. You use the term forward recumbent. I like to say upside down, easy, easy chair, lazy boy. Um, 
But my, my idea is that you are a wedge. You are the keystone of an arch of a bridge um, being locked in between a tilted forward saddle and a tilted back arm pads. Because if you, if you didn't do that, that's what's necessary to make it sustainable. Otherwise, you would much rather have the 85 degree shoulder angle uh, to, to be sustainable for a long ride. And all, all of you guys, well, Ky Kylie tends to ride, tended to ride, st stretched as well, but, but not just stretched, but low. Like this position right here, and what I think I'm seeing, and correct me if I'm wrong, and Eric, maybe you could talk, speak to this, or it really any of you guys. Um, when, I, when I look at this Ryan Dennis position, I'm, I don't think I'm looking at a low, at low armrests. In other words, if you, you know, if you just look at the elevation difference from the saddle to the pads, it, it seems like. And again, I sort of harken back to this, uh, you know, if you take the body and you, and you and you freeze it in place, and you simply rotate the arms up. You, you actually keep that right angle between upper and lower arms, but you rotate the whole thing forward about the shoulder. That actually argues for a higher pads position, not a lower pads position. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you just bring your arms forward and up, you have just added a little bit of stack and added a little bit of reach. But is uh, that what you're doing? I mean, it, my, my working assumption is that's what you're doing. That, is that, that, I don't know if that's what you're doing. That is, that is I. I don't mean to do it. It just kind of happens. Be, uh, you know, I do, you know, I do the trials. I do trial one, trial two, out through five or six. Yeah. And as I do that, the feedback that I'm getting is forward and up. Uh, the light bulb goes on. Now, okay, we're showing my old position. Um, but I, that's just feedback I got from people. Uh, I'm not. I'm not intentionally trying to raise people's arms forward and up. I just, uh, it's just happening um, that way. Well, I guess what I'm asking though is, is that, did I, am I describing this new longer cockpit raised hands position right? That the hips stay in the same place, the back angle remains the same, all that stuff remains the same. The hips position relative to the bottom bracket, all of it remains the same. All of it is exactly the same as the position I might put someone in. It, the only thing that's changing is that we're ripping your arms out of the shoulders, we're rotating them up, and then we're gluing them back onto the shoulders. We're just we're changing the orientation. We're, we're even keeping the upper and the lower arm exactly the same. We're just rotating the arms up without moving anything else. I, if that's not what you're doing, then I need it explained to me because that's what it seems like is, is uh, the that's, hallmarks. Of that's extent. And first of all, you know, I don't want to take credit for this. You know, I've, it, it's out there. I it's certainly not something that I invented. Um, I think but, you should take credit for it. Take it from me. <laughs> Just take credit for the darn thing. Uh, but I think, I guess that is a simple, that is a good way of describing what's happening. Um, but, but because Kylie, for example, Kylie, wait, is this Kylie right here? No, nah. no, no, this is you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't have I don't have Kylie at the uh, at the ready. I'm looking for him. I thought I'd throw up uh, throw me up there so you can kind of. But that's a horrible picture. I'll find a better one. So this this position certainly. I can actually pull pictures of Kylie and Eric from the wind tunnel. Oh yeah, Brian, you're still oh, here. Well, I I was four <laughs> centimeters high. <laughs> I think you were I think that this pretty picture pretty here. Position. This picture here, and Brian, you were there, so maybe you can talk to it more. But I think this position does speak to what Dan was saying about moving the shoulders forward and up and leaving everything else the same. I mean, if you if you take that ninety degree angle and you take the elbows and slide them forward, you just Assuming that they have flexible enough shoulders, their scapula will kind of roll forward and they kind of roll down this way and it just helps narrow the whole 
the whole individual. And narrow tends to be a little bit more arrow. Now, in the triathlon world, you seem to get a lot of, uh, I would say in that 30 to 50, 55 plus, you get a lot of people with broader shoulders or very inflexible shoulders. And you really can't move them forward too much because they just can't, their shoulders just don't go in that position. Yeah, that's what I what I see on the fit bike by taking people out way farther than actual bikes exist. Is it, I'm just waiting for the shoulders to disappear, and once they do, that's when I look to see where the bike's at. Um, because you're going from a you know like a bluff body to a streamlined body, like you said, the shoulders unless someone's just not able to, and that happens all the time too. But when the shoulders yeah, I mean, dis the, the disappear, problem that's when you. I yeah. mean, the problem we've seen in the tunnel with most triathletes is they're just not flexible enough in the shoulders to bring the pads in to help narrow it up as you go out. And they're not flexible enough to get out really long. Their shoulders just don't, their shoulders just don't go in that direction. Well, okay. Their so shoulders just stay wide and rigid and they can't really get their hands forward and out. Is this Kylie? This is Kylie. I'm, I'm getting them up here in a second. So everybody can see them. All right, there's Kylie. So that I think this represents what Brian was just saying. Uh, Kylie's shoulders are forward, and the front of the shoulder is not hitting the wind. It's actually the side of the shoulder that's facing forward now, and his shoulders are parallel to his lats rather than sticking out from the side. So I have. Uh, is that is that true, Kylie? I think we lost Kylie. Kylie, okay. no, we he's, lost. Either we lost him, or, or he's very yeah. still. He's perplexed. <laughs> perplexed. Yeah, no, we lost. Uh, we lost Kylie. He just uh, he just messaged me. He's restarting right now. He'll he'll be back here in a second, I'm sure. So, so one, of, one of the problems that I have is that I can't. You know, when I look at UCI rule and covered riders, you know, if I look at Grand Tour riders. Um, when I, when I look at Tom Dumoulin, I see what looks to me like a pretty orthodox position, but I don't know if he's orthodox because he wants to ride that way or if he's orthodox because he's encumbered by the 80 centimeter rule. And so if he wasn't encumbered by the 80 centimeter rule and, and the high hands rule, uh, like to me, I love that position. That's shoot. I, I'm. I salute that. That's that's fist orthodoxy. That's a typical traffic right there. But would he be riding uh, with those arms rotated forward about the shoulder if he if he legally could? I don't know. And until I know that, I I can't really know. I mean, orthodoxy doesn't traff on or, orthodoxy doesn't work using pro cyclists as evidence if pro cyclists are riding a contrived position that the rules circumscribe. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, that's a great point, Dan. I mean, these guys, we don't know what they would do if they were given the opportunity. And I think, you know, guys like Kylie, uh, myself, I mean, there's a bunch of months slow which that, you know, are kind of shooting for these, you know, stretched out positions. I mean, that's indicative of just trying to find you know, more speed, you know, something different that isn't being done right now, perhaps. Maybe it's been done in the past. I think you, you've spoken to this uh, before that, you know, as far as triathlon goes, those positions have been tried and abandoned. Um, but, yeah, I mean, what are these What are these old hour record guys like Boardman, the Superman? I mean, there's, there's, there's something to that, right? I mean, they obviously set the fastest uh, um, hour record. Um, today and the the UCI constrained position, yeah, it's fast for somebody like you know Bradley Wiggins, who's got you know 440 watts to throw down for an hour. But uh, but would he you know would it have been faster for him uh, if he could have played outside that box? Maybe not. Maybe he can't make 440, and maybe the benefits um, don't make up that difference right so i mean there's trade-offs with everything um but yeah we'll 
we just don't know. And, you know, picking a position because these guys do it and I don't have to fit inside that box like they do doesn't make sense for someone like me. Uh, yeah. Cali's back and there's his position. He shared. Yeah, I, took, uh, I took this video uh, a few days ago. I like to do my kind of fit videos outside when I'm checking up on things just because that's how you actually ride. Um, but basically, so Brian mentioned that he was going to pull up the A2 um, photo. So A2, I was at a, a pad stack of 575. That's because we couldn't get the P5 low enough with the stem that we had. Um, in this particular photo, I'm at 535 and a reach of about uh, 510, 515, I believe it is, to that center. Um, I guess, you know, my, my sort of theme on this, on, on fits these days is, is, is twofold. One is that um, I think similar to what Dan was just saying about how you're rotating the whole system forward. Um, I mean, my big thing is, is just optimizing this component of the saddle, which is extremely difficult. But that's the biggest thing that I've done differently since being from, five, from going from 575 to 535 is that I switched from the Bonrature RXL Hilo saddle to the dash, the dash hey, narrow stage, Gen 1 stop, is what I'm using. When you say you went from 575 to 535, is that pad stack you're talking about? Pad stack, yeah. So you're at 535, 510, is that what you're saying? At, wow, to pad yeah. center? Right. Pad center. Yes. Yeah. Okay, keep going. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's aggressive, but I would say if you looked at, if you look at A2, if you look at my 575 position, my hips are, are in the same place. It's just I've switched saddles, and this saddle really does allow more forward pelvic rotation. And so this, I'm not this fundamentally. What, what is this? What the dash or what is this? Yeah, the dash stage, the narrow dash stage. And Dan, you um, talked about that uh, last month about how the dash is the prototypical saddle for promoting this. What I keep hearing, and I, I've heard it from Jordan, and I've heard it from Kylie, and a bunch of guys, is that the trick, the thing about the dash is that it allows pelvic rotation. Right. And that's it. That's 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 the key that un unlocks uh, the power and and the freedom to well, really the power is right. pelvic rotation. And oddly enough, there's other kind of strange saddles out there that might do that like that by saddle. Um, Eric, I think you saw the by saddle, maybe you wrote it. I did, I really liked it actually. Yeah, um, it's this funky new sort of idea. And anyway, point is that it, it for, and I don't get it, I don't understand it, but it seems like there are some saddles, some split nose saddles that allow pelvic rotation. Um, like certain ISMs do, others don't. Um, and that might, that, you know, now, does that pelvic rotation allow Kylie to ride 40 millimeters lower um, with basically the same uh, power profile? Uh, boy, I don't know. I guess I better try that saddle. I, <laughs> so, so, Dan, that's, that's kind of one of the key components that allowed me, because I got on Dash. Oh, years ago. Um, what was it? 20, 2012. So I got on the, the, the dash in 2012. And it's one of the things because I was in the same camp as Kylie. I thought if you weren't low, you were slow. Right. And for me, that that was tough to do. So I was riding an ISM in a Dama. And I was literally just hanging off the front of that thing and uncomfortable as hell. After a 40K effort, I couldn't walk you know, kind of thing because, you know, chafing and um, it just it just wasn't good. So when I switched to the dash, yeah, it just helped me rotate forward without having to hang off the saddle and not be supported. Um, I mean, it's it's a key driver, but but still there's there's limiting. There's limiting. Um, features to you know, how low you can go. I mean, a saddle is not going to get you, um, you know, drop down. 
Now, if you look at some of the photos, some of the reasons why I came up, uh, a lot of my drop was just in my shoulders. So I was presenting frontal profile on my upper back, shoulders and upper back, because I was as low as my body was going to go. I wasn't going any lower. Pelvic rotation, you know, um, notwithstanding. So um, that's one of the reasons why I came up. And But I've always, you know, like Eric and like, like Kylie, the, the stretched out, get your shoulders uh, narrow. But one thing that James here, and I'm going to start paying attention to our comments, he doesn't really like us talking about the UCI. He pretty much says, who cares? Why are we, why are we discussing it? And I think, you know, one, one point uh, that I think should be made on that is we're talking about it because maybe we shouldn't look at them. Well, there's a, there's a reason why, and I think that it go back, goes back to my social comment. We are all going to emulate the pros, and, right. the, and it starts at the UCI time trial level, right? And, and it trickles down into triathlon. And so I think maybe there is some, call it organizational or cultural inertia, where we've, we've hung on to some of the things they do because we see them do it. Um, and then it just kind of is, is a, is a trend that takes a, w a while to wash out. Absolutely. So, yeah. and I that's the point, right? We're, we're saying we shouldn't look at them because we don't know what they would do if they weren't constrained. So that's the only reason that's coming up. But, right. but they were also at the, the forefront right. of coming up with elevating your hands. Like you didn't see that really perpetuate into trap on until you started to see it for a year or two at the UCI level. And well, now I would, it's not argue, the most ubiquitous at triathlon. What's that, Brian? Say that again. I would, I would argue that um, I don't see that high hands. You see with Anthony Costas, I can't think of anybody else that, that's riding like a, a Mantis position like that or an old Levi position. I um, wouldn't. I, I think I think the Mantis in some respects, because it was so high, has died. I think you're coming up with, with a middle ground, maybe a half mantis, but not, not forearms parallel to the, to the ground either. I think you're seeing, I think you're seeing some, you know, whether it's five, 10, 12 degrees tilt, where I think the mantis was more like, I want to say 20, 25 degrees on the up angle. And yeah. I, I have no, I've never had any trouble with, uh, with the forearms angled up. Um, some people in the old days, uh, Spencer Smith, Jurgen Zach, they, they would actually have bars marginally angled out. Even. Um, and I think that's because they like to pull up on the ends of the extensions and sort of cantilever their weight off the saddle. Um, and you know, whatever, whatever, I, I, you know, it's, it was, I never criticized those guys. Um, they wrote so well, but I, I don't have any trouble. Well, the question is, could they have ridden better if they had tweaked a few things, maybe a different seat, different bar? Yeah, it's a, yeah, I don't know. I, I have no trouble with the hands up. My, my whole question, I mean, my position has come up slightly, maybe two centimeters, two and a half centimeters over the last, I don't know, 30 years. And it's strictly a case of, I just can't look down the road anymore. Um, mm -hmm. I have some sort of, you know, old man's spinal stenosis <laughs> thing that, so unless I break down and go into one of those laser centers that you see advertised on the TV and um, get somebody to cut a hole in the back of my spine so I can look up, um, that's the end for me. I, that's, uh, I could, I, I mean, I'd be very happy riding the same position I rode 30 years ago. If it wasn't for that. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, an interesting point. That's actually, that, that's the thing that bothers me the most that I'm struggling with the most about my fit right now, which is that next stiffness. And particularly because it, it concerns me aerodynamically. If I'm sticking my neck up, well, we're, there's two concerns. One is if I'm sticking my neck up, am I really any more aero than I would be if I were, 40 millimeters higher if my dome is up in the wind. And second of all, I think Matt, Matt Steinmetz made a, a point recently about somebody he knows that, that discourages uh, super low positions because of the pressure 
that is put on the neck affecting things downstream, meaning ultimately the, the tightness up in your neck and upper back actually has an, a deleterious impact on your power production. Um, so I've been working really hard. It's, it's just like anything else, practicing keeping my neck relaxed, keeping my neck in a position where it's arrow but comfortable. And, you know, is it is it impacting things? And, you know, this is all sort of experimentation from my perspective. I don't, I don't know what the right answer is. And this is sort of where Brian comes in. And let me tie this around to the, the P5 disc. If I were going to buy the P5 disc, I would have to get a 51. And I would be at around 565, which is 30 millimeters higher than I am now at the same reach. And I'm just curious. If I bought that bike and I, I rode it and I rode the P4 a lot lower, what what's the power difference between those two positions? And then if I go meet Brian down at A2, what's the arrow difference? You know, what can I do for an hour on my P4 at 535? And what can I do on this new P5 at 565? And all these things are knowable. So we, I've got power meters on my bikes. I've got, you know, I can go meet Brian at A2. I, I just feel like there's no to the point of heterodoxy, what's the fastest position? And right. that's really what, what interests me about this whole thing. So, well, And that's funny you mentioned that because I'm, I have got some personal testing that I've been putting off and that's, uh, and, and so that's my current position. And that's one of the things I want to test because I ride pretty much that right there is with a sleeve kit is under 0.21. That's like a 0.202 or 203 CDA. And it's super comfortable. There's 19 and a half or 21 centimeters of drop between the saddle and the elbow pads there. This and is for I, your bike, Brian? Yeah, this is my bike, my current ride. Yeah, my, so my wingspan is, I'm six foot and my wingspan is just over six one. So I have slightly longer than normal arms. Um, and I think my shirt size on my dress shirts are 34s with a, when I think most people at around six foot are wearing 33s. But yeah, and in my the from the elbow pads out to the end of the extensions is uh, I forgot how much, but it's there's not a lot of bar left left in there. Um, but I also have very flexible scapula. My scapula will actually come forward and then rotate around the side of my body, um, and so this is a really comfortable position for me to ride in. And so that's one of the things I want to check is like when I have to look up to check for traffic, because I can only see maybe 40 meters up the road in this position, you know, what's the difference between that and heads up. And if heads up is no slower, or no faster, would I change my position to be able to see 150 meters down the road, you know, or how much more comfortable or less comfortable would that be? Cause I can ride this position for five hours. No problem especially uh, now that I got a slightly different seat. What seat did you get? Can you tell us? I did. I, I went to one of my athletes, uh, was living in Austin and she's got a fitting business there. And I went to some bike shop and I ended up with a fabric. It was a 70 <laughs> or $65 seat. And he, the guy had 200 seats sitting on the wall and we went through about 40 or 50 of them. And he's like, well, let's just try this. He put it on there and I sat on it, pedaled three times, got off. And I was like, take it off. I'm taking it home. Um, Cobb sent me a couple of saddles before they got released that I put on my bike and weren't the same. And someone else sent me a, another saddle that I don't even know if it went into production or not. And the, the $75 fabric was by far the best saddle I've ridden in the last 10 years. I mean, I love my Cobb Randy. It's just too wide in the nose. And I don't have, I don't have the childbearing hips to, to accommodate that width. Um, Kylie, to your question about the P5, um, three days, we have a couple, let's just have this conversation in three days. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm aware you've been hinting aggressively enough in enough forums that it's pretty obvious what's happening. <laughs> so, and no, I don't, I don't want that bike. I like the new P5 disc. It's sort of, I feel Cervelo's redeemed themselves. Um, I'm impressed with it. I want one. I just, I'm not sure that it's fast enough at 560 or 565 that's all okay. and just breaks <laughs> so james oh that's me okay whoa what was that anybody else get that yeah 
So I think that's Eric's that's Eric's final position when he tested. Uh, I don't remember what year it was. Maybe two years ago. It was it was two years ago. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. So that's. I mean that that position. Uh, can you throw that back up there? It's up. Please? Okay. It's up. It, he's yeah, not. Up. Oh, there we go. So I, I, and I don't remember what the numbers were, but I do know that the higher we brought your hands, it seemed like the lower the drag, the drag was. Um, Cause I think, and I skimmed over your test briefly uh, yesterday, but I think we tested with hands pretty much flat, like how I ride. Um, and I think we did five degrees and I think this was 10 or 12 degrees um, or maybe even 15 degrees. And this that, that 15. was, yeah, the 15, yeah, 15. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And so that, that ended up being the fastest p position for you by a, a fair chunk. It was like, every time we went up, your position got a little bit faster, um, versus arms more parallel with the ground. Um, and, and even at yaw and, and, and so this, this I think is where a lot of people in triathlon have started to go. And I, and I have my, my qualms with this because it works for some people. And I think, I think the faster you are, the more likely this is, this position is to work. Like, I think if you look at some of the, the UCI pros who are riding with their hands up, they're riding in such a low y'all environment that it's, this is, it works for them because they're not seeing seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 degrees of y'all. They're seeing two, three, four because they're doing 32 to 33 miles an hour where your average triathlete is 22, 21, 23, something like that. Um, and we see in the tunnel that people come in about 85% of the people who come in with this position at y'all, it just falls apart. I know when I velo velodrome tested me riding like this was super fast in the velodrome. And I think at y'all, it was costing me 13 or 14 Watts to have my hands up. We dropped them flat and that was the gap that was the difference. Like I saved 13 or 14 Watts right off the bat. Um, so Brian, when, when you guys tested this, this hand angle, um, uh, and the 15 degrees, I'm assuming that's the arm pads, not the hands. I mean, that's probably more like, I, I think we measured for the hands, but no, my, my question is, did anything change reach wise, shoulder shrug, turtling as the hands came up? Like did it allow for uh, for Eric to change his position, or is it just just elevating hands? Can I? Yeah, oh, Eric, you should you, you could probably talk to this better because I don't I don't remember. So I so I tested between 30, 40, and fifty degree ski bends, and a low mount Maduro, and then an extra low mount, and this is the extra low fifty, and I'm I'm a point two two. And 0 0.20 at yaw, so it works for me at yaw as well. Um, you can't write this. This was recalled. Uh, so <laughs> this was recalled, and it's been modified to be structurally sound. Um, Give me a little uh, <laughs> here. But we started out with the Adoro Low, which was I think 40 millimeters less reach. Mm. Okay. And so. For me, what I think is happening is that my shoulders start to disappear once you get to see the shoulder angle I have now. And then my, my forearms are just 90, my forearms are perpendicular, 90 degree angle, because that's the way, that's the way my upper arms are going. Um, it just supports my weight. So it, it's just a win-win for me because it's very comfortable also. Um, and I think if you look at a fist position, you know, your elbows, it seems like a lot of like elbows are more or less under the ears where if you look at some of the, the more aggressive time trial positions, the elbows are sliding even more forward. And so they're, so they're a little bit more forward from the ears than, than yours are. That's interesting. Uh, never even use the ears as a, uh, marker because I kind of, when I shrug, I pull my head back too. So it's not only a function of, you know, pinching my shoulders together, but I'm also drawing my head back. Um, yeah, but so, so we added reach and we raised the hands. Well, and like you were saying, it may, it, you know, that reach helps you. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, let's, I, I don't like to say it that way. I, I don't like to say that I raised my hands. 
I like to say that the hands were raised, like Dan says it, because I rotated at the shoulder joint. I just rotated the system forward and up. Um, and so the hands went with, right. I don't want people to go raising their hands just because it worked for one guy in the wind tunnel. Um, and I think the benefit of that, of moving the arms forward and up is that the shoulders kind of tuck into the back of the head and then you get that narrow and cause you can only get so low. You can only, your A can only get so small, but your CD there's an infinite amount of change you can make in your CD. There's, I mean, that's why we're still, we're, we're still getting faster by CD gains. No one's getting any lower. You can't get any smaller. I'm six, two. I can't get much smaller than I am right here. Right. Uh, but I think the CD is changing because of the way my shoulders are disappearing and streamlining with the rest of my body, which was allowed. What allowed me to do that was the extra reach. And can, I, can I ask? Can I go back to Brian and ask him something that he said that I want to make sure I understand? Um, did you say that a hands higher position worked for you until you got into a yaw, and then it cost you thirteen watts, so that you had to lower your hands? Is that what you said? When I tested. I tested twice in the velodrome and I've tested twice in the wind tunnel. And every time I test in the velodrome, the more I raised my hands, the lower my CDA went. But then we got in the wind tunnel and we tested at 10 y'all. And, 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 and to be fair, when I was racing that year, I was doing some analysis and I just, the numbers from the velodrome and what my race times were on my power up. So Heath and I had me in the, in there and, and we just dropped my hands to see what it was. We dropped it back down to parallel and then we we're going to start coming back up. And it was a 13 watt reduction in drag. And then this is by flattening your hands. Yeah. By coming from with my hands up to my hands more parallel with the ground. And this is at 10 degrees, you say? 10 degrees. And this is a, this is a trend we see a lot. Like we've had uh, the recent wind tunnel testing we did. We had a couple people who tested high hands. The only one it really worked for was a guy who rides 206 and holds north of 300 watts for a half Ironman. Oh. Everybody else rides more like 220, 222, and the, they were faster. They had less drag with their hands, more parallel to the ground versus even up as high as a, a five degree angle. So your current position, so I would, would I be right in assuming that if you were going to go after the hour record, you would have high hands. And if you were going to go right in, in Arizona, you'd have flat hands. Is that, is that it? I was racing in the velodrome. I would put that up to 12 and a half degrees. Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. Well, this, that's interesting because technically you could choose your bike position. Like you choose your wheels by looking at the weather on race day, the projected weather yeah. on race. I, I could. I'm not going to take that much time to wrench it in the morning. <laughs> well, that's because you don't have a P3X, Brian. You know, you yeah, not yet. Maybe, two, <laughs> maybe in three days. <laughs> now, I actually, you know, this whole issue that I'm having with my neck, there's, if, if I could actually have, say, a P3X or a P5X that could span this range of stacks that I would like to run, say, you know, 540 to 580, I actually would use you know, that front end adjustability to change my position based on the course. And it's kind of counterintuitive in thinking what I would do because I would actually be higher on a flat course than I would on a hilly course, simply because on a hilly course, I can get out of the saddle and rest my neck and, and shape it out and then bomb down the descents in full arrow. Whereas a course like Miami 70.3, or Eagle Man, those are the only courses where I really struggle to hold my position for the entire duration of the event. So I think these new front ends, you know, the resolution that you can gain, I mean, are, are marvelous for that if if they work for your entire range of stacks that you would like to run. And I think you, you're going to start to see stuff like that, people playing with that, uh, with these more aggressive positions. Um, anyways. Kylie, are you familiar with, and probably all you guys are, and I'm I don't remember the name of it, but SRAM has an electric 
Proper post? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Scherter has it on his Quebec bike. It's pretty okay. sweet. I just want, you, in the context of aero bar positions, I just want you to contemplate an aero dropper post. That oh, I'm contemplating it, and I'm contemplating it most in the context of gravel try. Because forget the I'm drop. Talking about, I'm talking about the tech not in a not in a sink post. Oh, you're talking about a front end. Yes. Okay. I mean that would be pretty slick in a race. Yeah, that would be. <laughs> you just you just hit the, the click on the end of your extension and you come up three centimeters. Can you imagine? Exactly. <laughs> Why not? That no, yeah, I, I, that's that would be. Well, actually, you have to click three clicks to come up three centimeters. Okay, yeah, there you go. You get one centimeter resolution. I like it. Yeah, of course. All right, I see where it's done. I like it. Yeah, you know, though, with some of the newer newer aero bars, they seem to be a little bit more adjustable for uh, for that height component versus what I have on my on my plasma. It might be. I mean, if you've got someone who you know they've tested a couple of different positions and maybe they they do have a. A more aggressive position for short course racing and then it's only a couple of wrench turns and they can raise it up you know 10 millimeters 15 millimeters if they're going to go race an ironman and, and and not have to deal with their their neck issues i mean that's right. that's where i see a lot of line improvements coming in and and working wonders for people or right. for you kylie yeah either people or there's then you there's you kylie there's, yeah. <laughs> Well, Brian, I think you're, you've showed it with a few other people that lower isn't necessarily always the fastest. Yeah, I mean, we've had people in there where we've raised them up 10, 15 millimeters, and they've actually gotten a little bit faster. I mean, I remember, I think, uh, one of the pros we tested back in the velodrome days, and we did some work in the velodrome, uh, I think we raised her up like 10, 10 millimeters, and she was actually a little bit faster. Um, yeah, but we've had, we've had incidences of that where, and maybe it's just a situation where people have, you know, they've always thought lower is better. The more, the lower you go, the more arrow you get. And then, you know, at some point it just doesn't work for them anymore and they're struggling and whatever. And if you can raise them up a little bit and they struggle less, maybe that's, maybe that's where that sweet spot is at. Mm -hmm. but, but wait a minute, when you test them in the velodrome, are you saying? So this saying? is back when we did when we only before we started using a two exclusively. But yeah, like I raised a pro up on her bike by I think it was ten millimeters, and sent her back out on the track to test, and she actually her CDA decreased. But what are you? What what is the? Uh, what variables are you? And I only bring this up because I'm going back and forth with somebody right now who's sort of a uh he's very technically minded he has access to a velodrome um and he's, uh, well i'm just, i'm not going to say who it is but it's uh because he asked me not to but um and he he you know he says well okay here's here's my two positions and the variable he's looking for is uh oxygen consumption and and uh heart rate uh, and and really um, the velodrome it seems here? to me it doesn't lie because you you know you're in his case it's a fixed gear bike right so here's the gear here's the cadence here's the position and then the variable is heart rate in this in this particular case um, and so when you but see, that kind of testing is a combo of, of both your biological response and also your aerodynamic response. It's, it's biology, you know, it's, it's physiology, it's rolling resistance, it's air resistance, right. it's everything. That's, so that's when you say you raise this girl up 10 millimeters and she got faster, is it just in the case of aerodynamics or was it sort of a combo of, were you testing everything at this, were you testing everything at once? I mean, I, I don't remember if she had a heart rate monitor on or not. Um, she did have power, um, and I don't remember. I'm, I mean, most of the time we have people ride at a sub-threshold pace because if you get out there and you're testing and you're doing 
14, 15, 17 runs and you're trying to nail each run, I, unless you're really fit, it's going to be a pretty, pretty tough session. So a lot of the times we have people at half Ironman pace, like putting out those sort of SWATs, you know, and I don't, I mean, I don't remember that. I mean, this is four or five years ago. I don't remember the parameters of her, her specific test. I know we just stacked up under her pads. We put uh, 10 mils of spacers under her pads and sent her back out on the track to test and see, saw the, uh, saw what the numbers were after, I think they ride 10 or 12 laps around the velodrome and you average out the numbers over those laps. Yeah, no. it's been a, it's been a while since I've tested in the velodrome. It's probably been f five years since we've done that. Six years. This okay. this position here we're looking at that I would consider that extreme. The the one I just put up. The yeah, one you just put let up. me let me throw it up so everybody can see it. I was just waiting for Brian. So that that's that's unorthodox. I think we would all agree with with this statement. Yeah. And that, somewhere between hetero and un. So that that is why I look how I look now. So do you see where my back kind of it stops coming down and it's all on my shoulders dropping down? Mm -hmm. So I'm like exposing frontal area. And and to speak about, you know, coming up and getting speed or going down and getting speed, when I tested in 2014, they were uh, <clears throat> the guy that was in the tunnel helping me, he was pretty adamant about slamming me. And the gains we saw uh, after the initial drop were, were minimal. I mean, I had to pull up the spreadsheet to look at it, but it wasn't anything um, to write home about. You know, we're talking but, a couple of watts, maybe. And this is your guy who's done 260 watts or something for, for an hour, 40K in yeah. a TT, not in this position. And your best one hour power last year in this position was what, 215? Uh, two thirty, two twenty three, two in the two twenty, two twenty two thirty. A massive amount, right? So it's like, what's run that out between the CDA difference and the wattage difference? I mean, assuming similar fitness, and you've got your answer, right? Which is faster? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, well, that's kind of well. What I was getting at is there's kind of a sweet spot. Like you have, and a, a lot of people have found this. Uh, Tom and Nott's one of them that you know as you drop there's kind of a window where you sit in um right. and it can be tight it can be like a centimeter it can be like a centimeter and a half maybe it's not going to be anything like the change that i did i mean i don't think between this and coming up six centimeters um well actually i only went up four centimeters from here but uh it's going to be in that range so there's definitely like kylie said there's going to be some trade-offs what power you make uh, versus you know what your CDA is, but again, there's there's that there's that space in there where there really isn't a change, right? Where your your numbers are pretty much the same, um, so there's no reason to go higher or go lower if that's what you're you're looking for. I think I think this I think the weirdest thing about this position, the first thing I would change about this position, and of course I'm not seeing very much of the bike. But you look like you're sitting back a bit. Yeah, yeah. I was yeah, doing the does. same thing. Yeah. yeah that, the very first thing I would do is uh, is I would I would push that saddle way forward, and I think that would fix a lot of the problems. That I mean, just as a triathlon, as an old school triathlon fitter, that's the very first thing I would do. That. Yeah. Um, the saddle setback there is. Um, I believe it's seven. So saddle setback hasn't changed. So from that guy to let me, uh, let me grab another one here. So from that to this, there's, um, there's no difference. Oh, well, then it's an optical illusion because you look like you're sitting quite a bit further forward there than you, than you're, than you are in that other. And you'll notice how to me, uh, I I just don't I'm not willing to stipulate to what you just said because a you look further forward and b your shoulder angle is fixed it's your shoulder angle is solved yeah so the difference between those two positions is four how many spaces do I have in here? can you go back to the other one can I look yeah. at the other one yep absolutely let me bring it up. 
Let me get there. Um, so if you look at like look at where my my butter. Yeah, I'm looking at that right. That's why I want to see the other one. Yeah. So let me close this out. And now the camera angles aren't the same, so there is some lens optics playing into this. Uh, I wish they were, but I didn't do that at that point. But you can see here, it should be up now. Yeah. You can see it's pretty much in the same spot. Um, now, are you, uh, I, I would assume that in this position, your pads are way further forward than they are in the, uh, in the second photo? No. no. Well, the only thing I think is you had a, you had a, you had a torso actomy somewhere. <laughs> yeah. You know, all I, these things cannot be true at the same time. I, I had, I had the same issues looking at it myself and outside of me leaning back, which is possible in this photo. Um, but I have, um, I mean, I'd have to go into Google photos and pull them out. Um, I don't have them readily accessible. I looked at three different helmets, uh, on 20 minute efforts. So, I mean, there's, you know, 60 minutes of me riding or wait, no, this one wasn't 20. The other one was 20. But they were still longer efforts. I stipulate that what happened is that there was a bee on the nose of the saddle in this photo that stung you <laughs> one second before this photo was taken. It, it, you know that that's that's entirely uh, possible. But I mean, if you look at so look at my um, let's pull it up here. So that's that one, and then let's look at this one pedaling here. I mean, it doesn't look uh, the casting now. I mean, your, your shoulder angle is largely solved in this photo. Yeah. The other photo. So, so unless you pulled the arrow bars way back, pull the shorten the extensions, did something, then then there's a very different posture on these other positions than on that first position. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to discount that. It definitely is. Um, yeah, here you go. Look, so here's now another one. You can see this. So here it's looking, it's not as extreme as the other one, but I've also brought up the front end. So my shoulders aren't, don't have that range. Um, like we were seeing in that first one. So but that's a lot of problems, I think. I saw another photo in the thumbnails. I'm sorry. I saw another photo in the thumbnails. Oh yeah, which one? You, you, uh, you I'll, I'll grab it. Uh, yeah, the one right next to it. The one. This one. Yeah, like there's two. Yeah, those two right side by side. You can see one's just a, that's just a much more compact position, and uh, for whatever reason, and and I don't have any I don't have any quarrel with that position. So you're saying between. This position that, that we is got not a, that is not the compact position. Okay. Yeah, the, the other one is the compact position. Those are exactly the same contact points. Yeah, then then the posture is different. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe um, maybe the shrug is not as complete. Um, I mean, you're you, in here in this case, your ears are well for well forward of your elbows. And in the other one, uh, I'd be interested to see what that looks like. Yeah. So the problem again is the angle of the camera. So it's not it's not fair to pick points like that. And um... but this this brings up a point though, and uh, and it's and it's too and it's too to error to, to to the point of Eric's position, which I admire at, in the wind tunnel from a couple years ago. <clears throat> the typical triathlete, what I would like to know, and of course, this is the difference. You know, we're talking about is the difference between time trialing and triathlon. And so um, would we see uh, 80 miles into the bike ride? Uh, and I'm just asking. I don't know the answer. I don't, you know, would we see those shoulders and those hands back three centimeters, 80, 
you know, nothing's changing on the bike. We're not getting off and wrenching on the bike. And and I and I, and it's and it and it's kind of a question both for Eric, but it, more so, it's a question for the you know the people who get set up this way. This is my this is this is the question that I would have. Is this a great 40k position? Uh, is this also does this position does the posture on the bike change somewhere between 40k and 180k? So that you end up riding with more of that right angle between the torso and the upper arms, and I'm not saying you will. I'm just asking the question. No. And no. and if you do, then um, then the question is, uh, how do you set the bike up? You set it up this way, or do you set it up the way you're going to end up riding? You know, 70, 80 miles into the bike ride. Yeah. I I'd love to answer that. I'd love to go out and do an Ironman so that I have that, you know, that data out there. But I, I just don't see that happening. The only thing I can contribute to that from my personal experience is, is training routes, right? So, like, when I go out and train, I don't sit up on the bullhorns. Like, I get on the bullhorns to, uh, to stop and to turn if, if needed. If needed, if it's a fast enough turn, or the bull horns are an irrelevant position. When I, you know, yeah, when so, I, that's, that's so, my point. so I, I sit, I sit arrow when I'm out, you know, doing a three hour ride, and I never once think that hey, I'd love my arms to be lower. It's contrary. Um, I, I would want to rotate back, in other words, my front end, because for me to be able to um, to shrug to have that better posture that you saw in that photo, or that I think we all agree that I'm, I, I have in that photo, I, I gotta be able to shrug. I gotta be able to pull my shoulders forward. And for me, having that, that reach, right, with the, the hands uh, rotated up, that front end rotated up, it just it helps facilitate that. It helps get me narrower, even without me. No doubt, I, I, yes, no problem. I mean, can we stratify? Can we stratify this between fitness levels? Because I think so if you I, I, are a fit athlete, I think they're going to be able to hold this longer. If not, it could be a two hundred k bike ride in the in the Ironman, and they could probably hold it. Where I think a less fit athlete is going to be out of this position before seventy, eighty, ninety k because they just don't put the training time in. I mean, it's training time versus comfort versus. Yeah, whether it's too aggressive or not aggressive enough position. So for me, I find it easier to hold this position for the longer distances than I do for the shorter distances. Interesting. Because I, I don't think that all watts are the same. Um, when you get up toward threshold, it's just I, I just am unable to, to, to hold this. Whereas when I'm going long, it's only – it's. 25% less or 30% less, but it seems a hundred percent easier and I'm just resting. I'm, okay, I'm can, I ask you, can I ask you this? Are you saying that it's easier to hold this position with at, at a lower effort level? Yes. Level? Yes. But I mean, have fair. That's fair. The question is if you ride that old, it's one thing to ride the lower effort level and say, wow, this is really easy. I can hold this long time. It's another thing to actually ride it for a long time. And so, uh, and I don't really ride my bike that long anymore, but I guess I would wonder what I would like to see you, you know, 80, 80 miles into it, into this position. So for me, the game changer for sustaining this position was the snub nose saddle, it forced me to lean into my bars more and it created that forward component of weight. Yeah. Um, and then. Eric, what saddle are you running? That's a Mystica there, which is now, which it used to be called the Tritone. Yeah. But you know, dash, by saddle, you know, what for me, the tilted saddle was the game changer. For Can I ask you about that yeah. saddle? Because 
there was the original tritone, then there was the mystica, and I didn't really consider the mystica in the same sort of category as the dash, but then I just saw these new mysticas, and uh, maybe they're not that new. Uh -oh. But there's, I think I saw them on some canyons maybe, I'm not sure. I think they were on canyons. <clears throat> And uh, as a matter of fact, I have a couple of canyons in my garage I have to take out of the box. Maybe I'll take them out of the box and I'll see what's up. Um, so is it the new, new one? Because the remember when they went to this thing where they had the five and a half centimeter or millimeter valley and then the six and a half millimeter valley. And then the, and then, then there was this new really sleek Mystica. Might, it might be several months old, though. I'm wondering which one this is, because I never found the Mystica. You know, you put you have a fit studio. You start putting people on saddles. The Mystica is never the one that you know. After a day of fitting people, you go, "Oh, wow! Everyone loves the Mystica. I can throw these other ones away." That does not happen. No, it's the it's the PN 3.0 that everybody picks. Yes, or the PR 2.0, or I mean, it's not the Mystica. So, how just, is this thing the game changer? Uh, well, because I was riding a Arion prior to this, a regular road saddle, or rather it was the Arion Tri-2, so it was a little bit padded, but it was just a regular nose saddle, and I had a vertical pelvis. Well, uh, that's like saying I found chocolate chips, and before that it was Brussels sprouts. Well, I didn't, I didn't say the Mystica was the game changer. I said, you know, the, the snub-nosed, tilted saddle yeah. uh, was the game changer. Uh, because it forces you, you to have the taint of steel, and and it, and it will work on a lot of any, <laughs> anything that's half decent. It'll work. On. Well, I'm just you know I I just don't think without without harnessing the horizontal component of weight at the saddle and at the bars, it's a lot harder to sustain a lower position because there's nothing holding you in. But if you have if you have something that's holding you in, it's easier to sustain for long distance. And I certainly have Ironman Coeur d'Alene. I was very motivated in State Arrow the whole time. And then most recently, Ironman Florida. Um, and I were in this position in Ironman Florida? For the most part. Oh, okay. Well, then you can. Then, then you can. Um, yeah. and when I get tired, for me, when I get tired, I'm leaning, I'm looking to stay Arrow even more because it's just, it's just more restful. Um, I might shrug less, but, um, I haven't had any issues. Um, you don't find yourself choking up on this position. You don't, as you get further in, if I'm sitting in a line, I could choke up just to change things up. If I'm riding in a pack. Is a typical um, thing that happens like this position right here that just came up on the screen. The typical thing that happens, the typical complaint is low back pain. And the reason that I believe you get this low back pain is you no longer have the upper arm that's perpendicular to the weight it's supporting. And so that weight holding up the torso is partially transferred back to the spinal erectors. And so you get, you know, 60 miles into a bike ride and all of a sudden you have a slow back pain. And, and then when you shorten the cockpit, um, that allows you to just rest all this upper body skeletally on the pads. But what you're saying is that if you tilt the saddle uh, so that it's pushing you sort of off the nose, but you stay on the nose because you're tilting the armrests to counteract that force, then you're still 100% resting, even though that shoulder angle is more obtuse than the, than the typical shoulder angle that you see underneath triathletes. Yeah, that's, I, that's my idea. Um, and I... I personally have L4, L5 herniated discs and I have no back, I have no back trouble um, riding this position. Well, you wouldn't, uh, that's not where the back trouble comes from. It's a muscular, in my opinion, in my guess, mm -hmm. the, the, the muscular problem, the problem that the, the low back pain you get is muscular. It's I not, feel like, yeah. I feel like since I switched to the snub nose saddle that my back, my, my back muscles are neutral and not, not tense well that's the that's the seat that's the holy grail that's that's the secret whatever position you can get in if you can isolate out your spinal erectors 
and and just rest your body on the pads. That's it. Now, what we're all talking about here is can you rotate the front end of the bike? Can you rotate your shoulders forward? Uh, can you rotate your arms forward about the shoulder and still hold that restful position and gain, you know, two, three tenths of CDA? Well, then, you know, orthodoxy is going to change. I mean, we're, this is the way we're going to ride our bikes. I, you know, I, I think it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been possible for, for me without, without that saddle. So yes, I think, and it, whatever saddle that is, wh whether it's the PN 3.0 or whatever, um, I, I just look at the, the way I used to ride my bike with a vertical pelvis and I would not have, this would not have worked. I don't think. Hey Eric, do you have any shots, um, of, uh, you, uh, riding, um, with a vertical pelvis? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> is it? Hey. I'm yeah. sorry, this is a family show. <laughs> <laughs> um, just give me a second here. I'm actually scrolling through your feed now, seeing if I can. Uh, Uh-oh. There's the, there's the one James wants to see. What does James want to see? He wants to see um, the, uh, the one from the tunnel um, that you use um, uh, yeah. with yeah. The, the selector. And yeah, it'll be up in a second. So uh, this is all James' fault. He sold me that bike part, and now he also <laughs> referred to me my first fit. Did so, he? Yeah. Yes, he did. Uh, so it's all James's fault. Okay, he's the plan. Got it. So um, that's his tunnel shop. We've already seen that picture. No, I think it's different, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's the same position, isn't it? Looks like the same position. Yeah, it'd be the same position. It's a different helmet. Yeah. So um, I'm going to share my screen. Yep. And I'll talk about the. Yeah. Okay. So on you. what I, you what I think you should, are you seeing me on a P4? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. So here, yeah. here I, here I am on a P4 with a Arion Tri Two saddle, vertical pelvis which causes me to arch my back, which causes me to need less reach. Um, and lot, and I have, you know, 60 millimeters of spacers there. Of course, because I had the P4, I had to slam the Ventus because that's just aesthetically, that's how it had to be done. <laughs> uh, it probably wasn't smart. What size of bike is that? That's a 58. Huh. What I've done now is that I've basically moved my hips way back and my arms way forward, which has just flattened my back or straightened it and made it more neutral. And I'm sure James is already mocking my number coming off <laughs> and my my winter booties and whatever else that he so yeah, artfully. But wasn't it like 25 degrees when you did that time trial? Yeah, this is this was Washington. This is pretty. Yeah. It was pretty cold. Um, I just like James's critiques. <laughs> but yeah, you're I, getting a negative 10 on that one. So I, as you rolled, as I rolled my pelvis forward, I was able to move my hips back, but still somehow kept the same hip angle, if that makes sense. Um, Cause I don't think your hips rotate around the, the great trochanter. I think they rotate around a different place. Pixar didn't happen. I need the next, uh, I need the, I need the before and after. Oh, you want to see the uh, the one we just had up? Well, I'd like well, to I see can, the profile. Maybe I he's got share a speed really here. Um, I don't have it readily available. Uh, I guess I do. Um, that's uh, – this is a couple of years later. I'm on the Mystica now with more reach. Well, you're just lengthen my ladder. No doubt about that. Yeah, and it's also just warmer warmer. back too on that saddle. I mean, that's also warmer cool. outside. That's got to mm -hmm. be nice. <laughs> yeah, the back is flatter. I mean, I I like that position better. Uh, now I would, st you know, I I would still pull your arms back if it was just me, you know, doing my thing. Uh, but in terms of the back position, I mean, that's obviously the best saddle choice for you. Yeah, really, for me, 
Um, and I think for a lot of whoever you are, you have to find the saddle. I think, I think if you've listened to the whole hour, the saddle is the theme is I think that the game yeah. winner of this, this hangout is the saddle uh, has opened up, you know, the competition in the, in the saddle companies right now is pretty, pretty fierce. And there's a lot of ideas and people are really loving the 3.0 and I happen to like this one. Uh, but I think that's been the theme of this talk is that if you find the right saddle, it, opens up a lot of opportunities because otherwise, I mean, this other picture, I was just suffering. It's only a 20 day time trial. Hey, Dan. I'm, I'm, no, not, I'm not Eric, happy. Eric, let me, let me interrupt you real quick here. Something that always sticks out to me or has stuck out to me is, is Dan has mentioned that, you know, not this position, how it looks like this, but you know, stretched out front ends have been used in the past. But these saddles weren't around back then. I mean, that's a component, like Eric keeps mentioning, that, that has changed. Um, and it facilitates being able to rotate um, or position around, right? So that you can, you can hold that, that, that added reach. Um, do you think that that's maybe what was lacking back then? And that's, you know, something that should be explored now. And maybe because of that, orthodoxy, does shift that we do start to move towards stuff like what Eric looks like there versus the uh, the screenshot, the thumbnail that I had up for uh, that, you know, Orthodox article. Here, I'll grab that by the way while you answer. Well, we've had uh, we've had plenty of cases where riders ride with flatbacks, um, and you know, speaking to Eric's point, I have a poll here that I took. Uh, about a year ago on slow twitch and uh 30 uh, what i don't know uh 30 30 some odd uh percent of folks said yeah they're comfortable on their saddle um <clears throat> and everyone else was you know 10 percent of everyone was i've tried one to two saddles and i'm not happy 20 percent i've tried three to six different saddles and I'm finally happy. Another 20%, I've tried three to six different saddles. I'm still not happy yet. And we had, you know, I don't know, upwards of 10%. I've tried more than six different saddles and I'm still not happy yet. So there's only, you know, I don't know, four, four in 10. I mean, certainly less than half of all slow twitchers uh, not found their saddle. They're just not happy riding their bike. They're not happy riding with their saddle. Right? He's absolutely right. I mean, the very first thing we do, this is why, um, you know, when, when we, you know, in all of my intersection with bike fitters, you know, do you have a, a fast way, a slick way to test saddles underneath people um, to, you know, find that right saddle? Uh, whoever it was, I think it was Brian, s s said, uh, oh, yeah, Brian. Tested. I don't know how you test 40 saddles in a day. I mean, with, unless you have a switch hit or some sort. He, he had a seat shifter or a switcher. Yeah. It, it took 30, maybe, maybe 30 seconds to switch saddles. Yeah. And you probably had a, a switch. Where what, was this? Did you say there was in Boston? Where was this? No, at? this was actually in Austin. Austin. Yeah. There's a, there's a thing called this, a switch it. And, and it, it's 10, you, you don't even get off the bike. It's 10 seconds. You just stand up on the pedals, switch saddle out, normalize for the height of the saddle relative to the rails and start pedaling again. And I recommend that for every bike fitter um, because you got to solve, if you don't solve the saddle problem, you never solve that. Mm -hmm. You're going to get that humpy back. You know, you're protecting yourself. You're protecting, you know, man or woman, you're protecting your, you know, Fill in the blank um, against the saddle. Who's the guy up there on the on the canyon? Because he's got a nice little hump in his back there. Um, yeah, it's it, now it could be that that it's just the you know that's the, that's the flexibility issues that you know, range of motion issues someone has. But there's plenty of people over the history of of the arrow bars who've been able to rotate their pelvis and ride with flatbacks. 
Um, so that's been around. You know, if you look at all these riders up here, they, you know, they typically tend most of the time to ride with that right angle between their upper arm and the torso. The question is, um, can you comfortably ride? Uh, I mean, most of these folks, you know, when we take pictures of most of these folks, um, they're riding with a relatively rotated uh, pelvis. Um, backs are pretty flat. <clears throat> if, if, they, if you could take all of them and expose them to the kind of position that Eric is riding, would they choose that position um, for an Ironman or, or a 70.3? I don't know. Well, I don't, one way to find out, I guess. I mean, it's going to take some time, but... No. I think that's, that's what Eric's finding, right? He's not sticking somebody in a position. He's working with them, and they're choosing that position. Um, I mean, well, to be to be fair, there have been plenty who have reverted. So, um, Dan brings up a good point. Is that where is? I mean, you really need to check at mile eighty rather than mile twenty to see if that's where we're going. Um, I, I would, I would venture that all five of these athletes are at mile 20 where it's all, it's at threshold and the train is forming and they're going hard right now. They're going way, way over Ironman Watts to stay on, on the train. Uh, so how do they look at mile 80? That's, you know, that's a better measure uh, if we're going that direction. Um, just because one person can do it doesn't mean all of us can, um, the one, person, uh, but, the one person who's out there that I can think of who has a more obtuse uh, shoulder angle than the rest, the rest of these guys is Keenley. Now, to sort of to Brian's point, and Keenley has all kinds of tech access, yeah. right, available to him. And to Brian's point, maybe... Maybe Keenlay is just, you know, crazy like a fox. Maybe Keenlay has figured out that it's more aero to ride stretched, but it's not aero to ride Kona stretched because of those yaws that you see all the time. Or, I mean, excuse me, with high hands, I should say. Um, so so Keenlay, as well as I can tell, is maybe, you know, somewhat adopting a position that Brian was talking about where he's riding that that more stretched position but with flatter hands. Um, I don't know. I can't I personally cannot ride like that. I will get low back pain if I ride like that. But I'm 62 and I'm a whip. So you know <laughs> if he can ride this way comfortably, then you know maybe this is the position of the future for Ironman racing. I don't know. But he's the only guy doing it. I just don't see other people doing it. That's, that's my concern, is until more people figure out what he knows, that's my concern about, about proclaiming a new orthodoxy. Well, we're not here to usher in a new orthodox, right? But, uh, but talk about that, perhaps, where is this going? And, you know, will we start to see this trend, you know, become more popular? Um, I mean, I think we're on the beginning of the trend, like, and we're still not sure which way it's going to trend. Yeah. But I, I think the hands thing, you know, I mean, one, one thing I think we haven't solved is whether Eric's idea of where the hands should be or Brian's idea of where at least his hands should be. Once you get out on the road and you're subject to a variety of wind uh, <coughs> vectors, yeah, so maybe that also comes into play, right? So Brian talked about people's fitness and, and how that can affect what you can ride. And then there's also the bike handling component of it. If you're not comfortable on the bike, you're not going to spend any time in the aero bars. And if, you know, raising your hands makes you, or not raising your hands, but rotating the front end up um, is going to cause you, and, and I don't think it causes handling issues uh, for me personally, but I'm a smaller guy, so maybe... You know, it, it's different for me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, if you're not going to be in the air position, then it's pointless, right? Yeah. 
Well, you know, it may be a situation where that that enables them to maybe hold a position that, yeah, maybe they would be five or eight or 10 or 12 watts faster with parallel hands to the ground, hands parallel to the ground. But they're not going to be able to hold that and they can bring their hands up. So they lose those watts, but they can ride an arrow the whole time. Is that faster than having to get out of the position and stand up and stretch their back? I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's that's something where you have to do a lot of field testing. And I just, I mean, your average triathlete's just not going to put the time in to do 12 or 15 or 24 plus hour rides a b a b you know back to back days or whatever a b b a actually would probably be a better way to do it on uh back to back to back to back days to find out what the effect is of their position when they've got a large fatigue load i mean maybe maybe the new trend should be they should go to the wind tunnel or go to their fitter after riding a hard 80 mile ride and then, and then do that end up at the fitter's house or at the wind tunnel or the velodrome, wherever they're going to test and then test. And then maybe you'll find the actual position that's the best for them. I just don't see that catching on though. <laughs> that's pretty extreme. <laughs> Slightly. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a lot of work to put in. All right, guys, I think uh, I think that's probably a pretty good spot to, to shut this down. Surprisingly, we haven't had any any questions here. We've only had heckling um, from from James and a few other folks that have just commented how awesome um, we are. Uh, uh, but, uh, oh, I'm sorry. How awesome the dash is. So that's uh, I mean, that's that's the theme, I guess, is, you know, the where we're going is, is being driven by by these saddles and, uh, and and what they allow. So that's- Can, uh, I, just, can I throw, uh, yeah, let's, before we leave. I was gonna throw out closing thoughts for everybody. Can, so, can uh, I be in the push bowl a little bit about the saddle thing? Yeah, yeah, go for it. I'm really disappointed in saddle companies in general. And I have been for a long time. Because if you, uh, if you, uh, reflect on this conversation that we have had. Um, there are certain saddles that keep popping up and I don't want to spend 500 bucks on a saddle. And I don't think very many other people do too, uh, either. And so one of the things that I guess bothers me is that, um, it's like with Hoka's, you know, it, we have this thing, we, we have this paradigm, we have this moment. And, and there's something that's going on. And whether it's saddle companies or running shoe companies, it seems like the very last thing that any of them will do is uh, contemplate the possibility that someone else might have an idea that maybe you ought to emulate or, or at least test. You know? so, so if you're selling Italia or if you're selling San Marco or if you're Prologo or if you're if you're any of these companies, and it's the same thing for with running shoes, but just with saddles, uh, you know, it costs you 500 bucks or four, 300, whatever it is, to buy a bond and stick it under some people and see if there's something there. And if there's something there, copy the darn thing. You know, copy, copy what, you know, it's like, uh, you know, Nick Salazar makes all kinds of great stuff. We love his stuff. But when he saw the speed riser that Cervelo made with the P5X, he was smart enough to think, well, here's one idea that I think I might emulate, at least, and I don't want to speak for Nick, but it seems like that that's what happened. Uh, and when, you know, Trek came out with uh, their XY pad prescriber for the speed concept, what the other bike companies did was they said, that's a great idea. We'll emulate that. We will do that. It took a long time, really. Took longer than it should have, but okay, it's a great idea. Let's emulate that. And so, I think saddle companies need to spend a little bit more time looking at what some of these other companies are doing that are allowing Eric to rotate his pelvis, or Brian, or you or me, and finally get into some you know decent riding positions. Um, and instead of sticking to their narrative, they're just sticking to their narrative. Like, this is our thing. This is our tech. Right, but nobody's buying your tech for use in triathlons. 
Why? Uh, so since we know that saddles are the biggest problem in triathlon, period, end of period, period, and all of triathlon, when it comes to rider comfort, just triathlon comfort, bigger problem than wetsuits, bigger problem than running shoes, set the saddle is the biggest problem in triathlon, technical product problem in triathlon. Since we know that, I just, you know, wish that saddle companies would take less than a generation to figure out that maybe their saddle designs could use some some importation of other ideas that other smaller but well-regarded saddle companies are deploying. Anyway, okay, that's it. That's it. So uh, are you proposing that we form a company and start producing good saddles? Well, uh, I'm still... <laughs> I still have PTSD from being a manufacturer, so. Uh, but I'll salute you, uh, and I'll help. Uh, and I've been look. I've been saying this to saddle companies left and right. Uh, I have, you know, I have my own handlebar issues too that I would like to see addressed. But the saddle is the biggest problem. It's all. It's the biggest opportunity out there. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, as a bike fitter, you know, I tell everybody, I tell, you know, Eric was just out at my place and, you know, he, you know, I was on my soapbox and, you know, uh, step one, find the saddle that works. Step two, commence the rest of the fit. Do not proceed to step two until you've solved step one, because you can't. Step two cannot be solved without solving step, step one. So, so what you're saying, Dan, is that everybody out there doesn't like their fit. They really screw the pooch because they're not sitting on the right saddle. Um, we fit a pro tour. Well, not a pro tour. We fit a pro, a top level pro woman cyclist sometime back. And she just sat went, moved right to the back of the saddle. Well, why do you sit back here? Well, that's where I like to sit. Okay. Well, why do you like to sit back there? Because it's more comfortable. But why is it more? I mean, I, I became a nag. But why is it more? And then blah, 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 blah. So, you know, finally, after about the eighth way of me asking her this question, she said, it's because of the surge seam right in the nose of the saddle. That's why. Oh, okay. Well, let's just change the saddle. We can. I'm sponsored by the saddle. Our team is sponsored by this. Okay. okay. So what if we changed it to a different saddle made by the same sponsor? Well, I, yeah, I suppose we could do that. So we put the, I happened to have that saddle in my inventory, put it on the bike. She, she moved right to the four. She moved eight centimeters forward. Dang. This was a lady who was always the chief lieutenant for the top rider in the sport. And the reason she was the chief lieutenant is she would get 80th in the prologue. And then that was the end of that, right? So she was stronger than the, the strongest rider on her team. Four days later, she went to Redlands Classic, which just concluded, not this Redlands, but this a few years ago. She got six in the prologue. Just because of the saddle change that allowed, the position change that allowed her to finally to put, put some power in the pedals. So it changed her whole, I mean, now she was darn near 40 years old when this happened. So, so she didn't have that much runway left, but changing the saddle changed everything about this woman's cycling because she was now no longer you know six the her sixth team member after the prologue and everything changed because of that so having heard everything you just said a saddle's not worth five hundred dollars <laughs> the wrong saddle's definitely not worth five hundred dollars well if it's the right saddle. And how many $500 saddles or $300 saddles do you go through before you get to the right saddle? Because most shops only stock two, three, four types, and they don't have a simple way for you to really test them out there in the shop. Or a lot of shops don't, at least the ones I've been in lately. Well, yeah. look, uh, this sounds like a setup, but look, this is exactly, I mean, you just, my, this is the, the last 10 professional years of my life. Uh, at, at least as I've devoted them to talking to bike shops, bike fitters, and all that. 
And one of the reasons that you're going to see this sort of paradigm of the bike fitter, you know, the Jim Mantons, the Ivan O'Gormans of the world, uh, you know, the John Blyers, Ian Murrays, you know, these people, Port McGlynn, these people that have these studios, they're going to start, uh, become, they're going to become more prominent. They're going to be they're they're going to be the the sellers of these boutique saddles because they're going to they will have the expertise and the inventory uh, and the tooling to let you go through this process. But these processes, we did this thing I don't know eight years ago called the Slow Twitch Saddle Tour, where we sent out these devices that that Brian's talking about switches. We sent them around to all these shops. Cost us a lot of money. To, these things cost us 800 bucks each at the time. Now they're down to 200 and something dollars. But we had to send these all to, all to shops and they get them sent from shop to shop. And and then people would come in and we mandated, that, okay, you guys gotta have all the right saddles. You can't just have tooling, gotta have saddles. And then pe slow twitchers would go in there and they'd go through this process, this protocol of, you know, uh, and really, a process like that, it's just like Match.com. You might not know after the first date if this guy is the one, but you'll sure know when he's not, right? You'll know, you'll know by the hors d'oeuvres that this is not the one, right? And that's what this pro protocol is like. You'll know after 30 seconds, this is not my saddle. Get this thing out from underneath my hiney. And then you 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 know you sort of narrow it down to the finalists. Okay, here's these three saddles. Let's try these over again. All right. Okay, we'll get it's these two. Then you settle on one. Okay, now the next next is let's go out. Let's stick this on the bike. Let's go out and ride this for two or three days or a week or whatever. Let's see if it works. Um, but you know that's how you that's how you solve the saddle problem. All right, guys, we're 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 almost two hours here, so uh, I'm gonna call this. Just get warmed up. It's <laughs> got kids to put to bed, and uh, yeah, thanks for thanks uh, for having us. Yeah, yeah thank this you. is awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah, I think uh, I think it was a great conversation. I love where we ended up. I mean, I, I wish Kylie would have hung around for the for the saddle portion, but uh, he had to he had to jump. It's all, in. It's all about the swim. It is. He's got to get that. Uh, he's starting to get some fitness, so he's got to get it in. So, uh, thanks everybody for, for joining. Um, and if you got anything you want to say in closing, go ahead, Eric. Uh, no, I just wanted to say thanks. I really need to get going, uh, get these kids to bed. Uh, but I'm looking forward to more discussions in the future. And I've really, I'm thankful to all of you for what I've learned from, from especially Dan and Brian. Um, so thanks. Hey, thanks for putting it together. Appreciate yeah, it. thanks, man. This is great. Dan, it was finally nice to cyber really. I mean, we've traded emails and talked on the phone before, but it's actually nice to to, to sort of meet you face to face in some respects. And right. uh, appreciate yeah, it. And I, I mean that email ID I sent you many years ago. Uh, you should mm -hmm. dig that back up. I think that's still valid about right. fitting at the wind tunnel. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Well, I can figure out a way to fit it to one tunnel. Boy, would I. Uh, yeah, so I, I can figure me. that out for you. <laughs> yeah, well, you would be the guy. You are you are the one guy who would know how to do that. So let's talk about that. All right. All right, guys. And seriously, thanks, everybody, for being on the panel. I really enjoyed it. It's uh, very informative, and I learned a lot. Awesome. Well, All right, thanks. Then we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm going to go ahead and stop this broadcast. And, uh, yeah, so I'll try to throw some links on um, – Actually, I didn't go into any articles. I had planned to bring up some of uh, Dan's old articles on uh, orthodoxy and alien stuff, but uh, there's really not too much to link. I'll, I'll throw some stuff about saddles and stuff down in the description. But, uh, yeah, thanks for watching, guys. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll do another one of these soon. All right, All right. good night. Good night.